All right, so everybody's returning to your seats. If you'll turn with me uh, in your Bible, uh, we're going to be in a couple of spots today, a couple of passages, uh, both very brief. Um, first will be uh, Psalm. I know, I think it says in your bulletin, verses 1 through 2 of Psalm 1. We're actually going to do three verses, okay? So Psalm 1, 1 to 3, and then 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 6, okay? So Psalm 1. 1 to 3, and then 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 6. Let's hear God's Word together now. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Now, if you'll turn with me over to 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 6, this is the Apostle Paul. He says this, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, help us please this morning. Give us grace. Help me as I speak that you would give me clarity and that you would help all of us to understand, to recognize, to own, and to apply those things that you have for us today. And we ask you all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, back in my hometown, uh, there's this man named Mr. Reggie. And I've known him since I was, I mean, little, little, little boy. He's a pastor of a small church in the next town over, uh, just town, you know, kind of south of us. And I actually had the privilege uh, a few years ago even of, of conducting a funeral service with him. Uh, we had a mutual friend, and we got to do that together. And so I've seen his ministry uh, up close somewhat uh, over the years and really been blessed by uh, who he is as a pastor. As This is a man in his early 70s now and been plowing the road for, I don't know, five decades. Uh, but, but it's not really his pastoral ministry, as vital as that is, that's made the biggest impact on our little area of southeast Missouri uh, or upon me over the years. Uh, rather, it's his steady presence around town and in people's lives. Uh, let me explain. Ever since I was a little boy, again, I told you I knew him for a long time, whenever my mom would say the phrase, let me call Reggie, I'd get really, really excited. You see, he spent decades as the bus mechanic for our little school district. So um, Portageville, real, real small town, real little school district. And so we didn't have a, a you know, staff of bus mechanics. We had a bus mechanic and that was Mr. Reggie. When that position, he knew virtually before anybody else when there was bad weather, if there was going to be a school cancellation or not. And there's, you know, of course, no internet, no mass calling system uh, in place. So if you thought there was going to be a closure, you'd have to get up real early and turn on uh, the news broadcast out of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, about 60 miles to the north, and they would have a little crawler going along the bottom of the screen. And it would say the name of the town, and it'd say if they were closed, if they were open, or if they were going to open uh, with a delay. And so, you know, you'd be sitting there, you know, eating cereal, like just watching the news, praying that Portageville is going to come across the bottom of the screen. And that's what, you know, normally people had to do. And that could take some time to find out. I mean, school started at 8, you might not find out until 6, 30, 7 o'clock if it was going to be closed. But since mom, who had uh, also for years, she had worked at the school, she'd gotten to be good friends with Reggie, she could just call him and find out. And uh, so 
she'd dial up to the bus garage because she knew he was going to be there, and I would hear her side of the conversation, and that would tell me whether or not uh, you know, I could rejoice and I could get on my snow gear and head off four-wheeler riding, uh, or if I had to get my stuff together and trudge the five miles uphill both ways to school as one did in those days. Uh, from that position in the bus garage, uh, Mr. Reggie was able to interact with people not only around the district, but people around town because folks would, would swing by and they'd say, hey, Reggie, you know, I'm having trouble, you know, with whatever on my car. You know, they didn't really want to take it into a shop because who wants to spend all that money? But if Mr. Reggie could just give it a quick look and say, oh, you know, it'll probably be okay. Or if you had a little bit of a, a, a dent in your bumper, you know, he could take a, a, a come along and, ch -ch 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 and ratchet and pull the dent out. You know, little things like that he'd do for you just for a couple of bucks. And uh, so everybody around town was always seeing him. And as he would talk to folks, He'd, and I can, I mean, I can picture him as clear as I'm picturing any of y'all right now. Uh, he'd always have this huge beaming smile and a kind word for everybody. Uh, when people needed prayer, he was there. Uh, when they needed encouragement, he was there. To this day, whenever we're in town and I see Mr. Reggie at the grocery store or something like that, you know that your day is about to improve. Because of this faithful, gospel-saturated presence, he has made a profound impact uh, around our community uh, with black and white. Uh, he's, uh, again, a small town in southeast Missouri. People have these stereotypes about, uh, you know, racial tensions. And in this little town, everybody got along wonderfully regardless of color. And Mr. Reggie's this black pastor doing this ministry in these white churches and, and stuff that nowadays people would think is just anathema. And is day in, day out there because of the gospel presence that he was and is. And so he walks around and he's just sharing the gospel with people. Like I said, black and white, rich and poor, uh, country and more country. There's no city where I'm from. So it's country and more country. And all these things, Republican, Democrat, everything in between. The story, y'all, of how God blesses the world in large part is the story of millions and millions of Mr. Reggie's, people whose names we're never going to know, but who've brought the aroma of the gospel, the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for people like us into the arena of society that God has placed them in. In our current series, we're looking at our core values, those convictions that drive what we do as a church and hopefully as individuals as well. So today we're going to be looking at the third of those convictions, gospel presence. Now, when we use the term gospel presence, you can look on the back of your bulletin. It says it. Uh, we mean that, quote, God has called and equipped us to share and live out our faith right where we are, in our neighborhoods and workplaces. The gospel isn't merely about creating great churches, so it's not less than that. It isn't merely about creating great churches, but great towns as well. Now, today's actually the second week in a row that we've been looking at this particular core value. So last week, we stepped back and took something of a macro view of things, looking at these broad descriptors that Jesus applied to believers in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. This week, we're going to narrow down the focus a little bit and think more about what this looks like on the ground in practice. All right? So with our passages in Psalm 1 and 1 Timothy uh, to lead us, we're going to break down our time together like this today. Uh, a gospel presence rooted in God's Word and a gospel presence right where we are. Okay? Rooted in God's Word right where we are. Let's jump in. Uh, a few weeks ago, El Arroyo. Anybody know El Arroyo? Okay, yeah. See those hands. Mexican restaurant. Been in Austin forever. Uh, near downtown. And they have their, they're famous for their marquee sign, their billboard. I mean, there are literally tabletop books you can buy with just El Arroyo signs in them. And uh, the El Arroyo sign, Erica shared it with me, had a message and it said, our chips are like your lawn, golden and crispy. <laughs> uh, you relate to that? I sure can. Uh, I sure can. My yard looks like somebody's just scattered hay all over the top of it right now. Uh, but as I look around at most of the trees in our neighborhood and in the area, what about them? They're thriving, right? Most of them are doing just fine. Why? Well, because their roots have worked down and around beneath the surface to find water. It truly is extraordinary if you think about it. Because of the water source that those trees have found, maybe 
far, far away, they're able to flourish. In fact, I was reading a story just the other day about a wild fig tree in South Africa. Apparently, fig trees are everywhere in South Africa. A wild fig tree that had a taproot that has been measured by researchers to be 400 feet long. Uh, because of a series of caverns known as the echo caves close by, researchers can actually see the root uh, running beneath the surface like a big water pipe where it finally settles and meanders into this subterranean water source, pumping about six gallons of water per day up to the surface. Consequently, even in this hot, sunny, arid environment, that tree grows figs just fine. It's all about where it's rooted. This is the picture we get in Psalm 1, and it's the key to being a gospel presence. Uh, look at verse 1 with me. It says, Blessed is the man. Okay, that should make us all sit up and take notice. Uh, of course, when it says man there, it's using that inclusively. It doesn't mean as opposed to women or as opposed to boys and girls. It's blessed is the man, generically speaking. So blessed is the person. That, that ought to make all of us sit up and take notice. Now, there's a separate word in Hebrew for blessed. This ain't it. Uh, this is actually the word for happy. It's used 28 times uh, in the Psalms. Uh, and I don't know about you, uh, but I want to be happy. Anybody else want to be happy? Yeah, you should. If you don't, we need to talk. Uh, that, that word gets a bad rap in Christian circles as though uh, happiness is not really a worthwhile goal. But again, it's used almost 30 times in the Psalms. So I'm pretty sure it's a good desire. Don't try to be more holy than God here. Uh, and by the way, again, like I said, this is all inclusive, applying to everyone. Blessed is the man who. So right from the jump, God's telling the kind of people in Scripture, He's saying this is the kind of person who's happy, who God makes happy. He starts off by putting things in the negative, the psalmist does. So blessed, again, literally happy, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So there's a certain way of life that the person who would be happy doesn't engage in, right? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You can kind of see the progression there, right? Walking, and then standing, and then sitting. Really taking in that worldview. You see, the, the wicked delight in evil. The sinners here that are mentioned aren't repentant sinners, uh, people trusting in God's mercy. Everyone's a sinner. This is talking about people who enjoy sin, who revel in it. The scoffers laugh at God's Word. They discount His presence. They treat Him as insignificant. All these people have drilled the taproot of their lives into godlessness, into a worldview and a heart posture that says God either isn't there or He doesn't matter. And it's possible to throw your lot in with those people and drink that same poison. And note, again, this verse isn't describing a one-off action. It's talking about a lifestyle. Look again. Walks, stands, sits. These are, these are dispositions. These are commitments. Drilling the taproot of your life into godly, godlessness. And God says, blessed is the person who doesn't do that. Instead, what's the contrast? What's the contrast? Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. That's strong, strong language. Uh, delighting in God's Word means you're thankful for it. You enjoy it. You want to live by it. But the psalmist goes even further. The truly happy person meditates on God's Word. One of the literal meanings of that verb for meditates in Hebrew is to growl. And as I've told you all a thousand times before, it's the same word used to describe a lion gnawing on a bone. It's the same word. Meditating on God's Word means soaking it up, learning it, reveling in it. Now, before I go any further, let me address a common concern that you may have, and I address it because I am a human being, and I think y'all are human beings, so I'm pretty, pretty sure we're in the same spot here. Do you universally delight in God's Word? Anybody in here? Like all the time. Like, I mean, 
you know, like on this is spinal tap where the volume goes to 11, is your heart's volume turned to 11 always when you come to God's Word? Do you always meditate on it like you should? Probably not. Um, and I get it. Our feelings, our desires are fickle. So at any given moment, things may not look so hot. But again, this is describing a lifestyle over the long haul. This is how the happy, the blessed person responds to God's Word. And in those moments when you don't delight in His Word, when the last thing you want to do is meditate upon it, you find yourself asking God helping to help you to love His Word, to help you spend the time and energy you need to soak it up. Maybe sometimes you're simply saying, God, I don't even have the want to, but give me the want to. Help me to want to want to. Okay, you find yourself in that spot. See a lot of heads nodding, so I know that we're all in the same place here. And, and here's why this posture of delighting and meditating is so important. Because God's Word is His Word, right? It's, it's from Him. It's not an abstraction. It's a perfectly accurate account of who He is, what He's done, what He's promised us. Truly delighting in God's Word is delighting in Him. Meditating upon His Word is, is meditating upon Him. Trusting His Word is trusting Him. It's kind of like when Erica and I were dating long distance. She was here in Austin. I was in Kentucky uh, in school. Uh, we would occasionally write each other letters. And I know some of y'all don't know what a letter is, but it's take a piece of paper uh, out of a notebook and you get out a pen or pencil and you write down like real words and uh, put it in an envelope, stamp, post office. And uh, so three days later, bada bang, he got you a letter. And so we would do that sometimes and write each other. And when I would get one of those letters, I didn't just kind of scan it and toss it in the trash. All right? Um, I didn't just put it in my file drawer and think, oh, you know, that's nice. One of my raving fans. Right? No, no, of course not. I, I took those letters and I would read them again and again and again. I delighted in them. I meditated upon them. Why? Well, because they were coming from her. My posture toward those letters was, in effect, my posture toward her. So when the psalmist says that the blessed person, the happy person, delights and meditates on God's Word, he's ultimately saying that, that person is delighting in and meditating upon God Himself. So we root ourselves in God's Word, and that, he says, is where happiness is to be found. And because the blessed man, the happy man, is rooted in God's Word, what does his life look like? Verse 3, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Just like that fig tree down in South Africa, a tree planted by, by streams of water has deep, strong roots. Even in dry, wet weather, its leaves are still green. It still bears fruit. It's doing what it's designed to do. And the psalmist is saying that the person who's rooted in God's Word is like that. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it say there in that psalm that the tree that is is always that is by the stream will always have like perfectly sunny weather, like I mean perfect conditions, seventy two degrees, no humidity, perfect. Does it say that that the conditions around it will always be great? What's the emphasis? The external conditions or what what it's rooted in? What it's rooted in, right? See, when we're rooted in God's word, loving Him for who He is who He's shown Himself to be through His Word, you'll be the person you're supposed to be. You'll do what you're designed to do, bearing the fruit that you're meant to, meant to bear. And all that you do, you'll prosper according to God's good purposes for you. So it's not you know, meant to be like a lotto ticket. You know, if I like, read my Bible, I'm going to you know, make $10 million. I mean, that's not, that's not what's going on here. Okay, Just put that out there. Uh, but that, that all that you're designed to do, all that He's set apart for you is going to function rightly. Not absent difficulty necessarily, but through that, through the circumstances that He's got you in. Beloved, 
we really can't be a gospel presence if we don't understand this first point. That's why I wanted to talk about it this morning. Uh, there's no way that we can share or live out our faith uh, as we should without being rooted in God's Word, without knowing His character, His works, and His promises as He's revealed in Scripture. Now look, you might say, Brian, I don't know the Bible at all. That's it. I got it. I understand that. Start right where you are. Okay, start right where you are. That's fine. Like wherever you're at, start there. But realize that, that the more that we get rooted in God's Word and looking to Him, trusting Him, hoping in Him, the more that He's going to use us in some specific ways. Again, I don't know how that's going to look. I'm, I'm not a prophet. But that's the principle here. I just don't want you to say, well, if I'm so low down the line, why should I even start? No, no. Start right where you're at. God is pleased with your effort on that. When we are rooted in God's Word, we can be a gospel presence right where we are. So let's look at that now. A while back, a friend of mine here in town named Scott Reese, and I know I'm using his name, and he told me I, he told me I could because uh, I asked him. I said, this I think would actually make a good illustration of something I'm talking about. Uh, he started feeling that God was calling him to run for the LISD school board in November. Uh, and before I go any further, let me say this. This is not any kind of a campaign endorsement, okay? He's just a friend of mine. Yes, I am, I'm the chaplain on his campaign, but I have no idea if he's going to win. I don't know if God wants him to win. I don't know any of that. I just, I'm, I'm simply using this as, as illustrative purposes in our society these day, this day and age. I feel like I have to say stuff like that, so pardon the disclaimer, but there it is. Scott started, uh, started feeling like maybe God was calling him to run for the LISD school board uh, here locally, and I don't know if y'all have ever, has anybody ever paid attention to local politics? can be a blood sport, right? be very, very difficult. Uh, being a board member in any school district, regardless of size, can be a huge challenge. Uh, but doing so in a district with six high schools and almost 40,000 students is a horse of a different color. So he spent time, I mean a lot of time, honestly trying to get out of this, uh, thinking about what it might look like and what the cost would be. Uh, in terms of time and energy and all those things. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he sought counsel from a number of sources. And eventually he decided to pull the trigger. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Uh, Scott had never had any interest in running for school board. I don't think he's ever thought about running for any kind of office at all. So what got him to thinking that maybe God was causing him to serve in this way? Uh, well, he has lots of organizational experience from his former military service, and he has business acumen from his civilian life, and, and he loves the Lord, and he wants um, kids to be in an environment where they can learn truth and where they can thrive, and he has the bandwidth to do the work. And all that was enough for him, and so as he started talking to other people, uh, they all agreed. Now, again, I'm not mentioning this as any kind of an endorsement. You vote for who you need to vote for. You do your own research. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm bringing him up because of this. Scott is somebody I respect because the dude, he, he's just a guy just looking and saying, where, like, where does a gospel presence need to be in my community? Here's a place maybe I can help. I'm going to give it a shot. But that's it. That's the calculus behind this. Just wanted to be a Christ-exalting example and presence right where he is. He saw a need and figured that God might want to use him in it. And I mentioned his name because that is as local and as concrete as it gets. Sometimes um, we as Christians picture ourselves really serving the Lord someday, right? Probably in this far off kind of misty future where we can only see a couple of details, but things are just perfect. The stars have aligned. We have unlimited time. We've somehow become independently wealthy. Uh, we're, we're happy and jolly all the time. Our health is at maximum vigor. Our relationships are perfect. And then, then, we will really commit ourselves to being a gospel presence. Or, or we think, oh, we'll serve Him in some glamorous way, also in the future, that you'll feel awesome about and that people will tell you you're awesome for. But what if, what if being a gospel presence, sharing and living out the implications of what Jesus did for us, what if it's something that happens right where we are? In the here and now, 
when life is as messy as it always has been and newsflash as it always will be. Look with me again at 1 Timothy 2. This isn't going to be an exhaustive exegesis of this passage. Uh, Rather, I want to point out, kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about. So let's look at the text again. Uh, Paul's writing to his protege, Timothy, who's pastoring in a church in Ephesus, uh, perhaps the most important city in the Roman Empire outside of Rome itself. It's wealthy, it's cosmopolitan, it's the connection point culturally and religiously between the Eastern world and the Western world. If there was ever a place that Christians and a young church could inject a gospel infusion into the artery of the Roman world, this would be it. Okay, hyper-strategic, right? They have a pastor who was handpicked by Paul and trained by Paul. Doesn't get any better than that. Okay? So what's the play? What are they going to do? Man, I bet this is going to be something really, really overtly exciting and flashy and awesome is going to have them on the cover of the local Roman papers. All the Christian trade publications are going to want to talk about what they're doing. What is it? What are the marching orders? Verses 1 and 2. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high positions. Wow. Not what you would have expected, right? If you didn't already know that passage, you'd have probably thought something else was going to get said, like some layout, some incredible strategy. This is the strategy. Notice Paul's language. First of all, that denotes, as uh, commentator Don Guthrie says, not, not primacy of time, but primacy of importance. Timothy, this is the first thing you need to have your folks do. That's what Paul is saying. Then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made. Think about how glib we tend to be toward prayer. Does Paul sound glib to you there? Me either. And who are they supposed to pray for? For all people, for kings, and for all who are in high positions. Now, the first part of that command makes sense. They were to pray for all people. No problem. Get outside your own box, your own little concerns, and pray for others, Christians and non-Christians, friends and enemies, rich and poor, everyone. But when Paul makes it clear that all people extends to rulers, that's astounding. There were no Christian rulers in existence, right? Nero, the emperor, was a notorious enemy of Christians and of any kind of common goodness, frankly. But Paul still says, pray for him. And pray for every other ruler regardless of who they are. So right where these believers were, what was their big task? To pray. Nothing glamorous, nothing awesome. Just doing what every believer has the privilege and duty to do. Man, think about that. Didn't require special skill or training or anything. Just humility and trust and a willingness to go beyond the limits of what and who people might normally want to pray for. Now, what does any of this have to do with being a gospel presence? Everything. Look at the rest of verse 2 with me. That we may live or lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. But keep reading. Why is it important that these believers be able to live like that? It's not self-serving. Why is it important? Verses 3 through 6. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Uh, Paul's assumption is that as believers live peaceful, quiet, godly, dignified lives right where they are, that that would grease the skids for the gospel to move forward. That's the assumption. John Stott says it this way, quote, The logic of this seems to be that peaceful conditions facilitate the propagation, so the spreading, of the gospel. Certainly, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was a major factor in its early rapid spread. The ultimate object of our prayers for national leaders, then, is that in the context of the peace they preserve, 
religious and mora religion and morality can flourish in evangelism go forward without interruption. Now step back and think about what Paul's saying. He's telling these Ephesian believers in the heart of the Roman culture that there are two critical things they can do to move the gospel forward, to be a gospel presence. One, pray. I mean, pray like crazy. Pray big time. Two, through their prayers, they'll be able to live godly lives. Nothing spectacular, nothing theoretical, nothing in the distant future, just being faithful in the ordinary things to which they've been called. Now, before we wrap up, I, wanna, I want you to think about one other thing. Okay? Look again at verse 3 with me. And Paul tells the people, uh, after he tells them to pray so they can live godly lives, look at what he says. This is good and it is pleasing to God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God, our Savior, okay, is pleased with His people's obedience here because He wants the gospel to go forward. He wants people to know that Jesus lived and died for sinners. He wants people to know that He conquered death and hell on their behalf. He wants people to be saved. Y'all, when we commit ourselves to being a gospel presence, we're not just carrying forward some cold, stoic mission from a cold, stoic deity. No, beloved. He is God, our Savior. Right? And we're seeking to reflect His heartbeat for people like us. When we choose to share the gospel with those around us, when we choose to live in such a way that we're showing forth the beauty of what Jesus did for us, when we choose to be people who exhibit grace and forgiveness and love because we've so richly received the same. That's what being a gospel presence is about. That's, that's a glimpse. It's not exhaustive, but it's a look at what God can use His churches scattered throughout this town how He can use us to be that salt and light that we talked about last week, to be that gospel presence so that He'll be known and loved and trusted uh, for His glory, for all of our joy. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank You again for this time this morning. Uh, we thank You that You love us. We thank You that You are the saving God, that You're not just some stoic, far-off deity that... Um, would not in any way be worthy of our worship. Uh, instead, uh, you are the God who chases after people, who saves. So Lord, give us hope and confidence in Jesus today. And we pray these things in His name. Amen.